Good afternoon. <laughs> the bell right? See how seats are The ball. Sorry, they were part of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we thought maybe your heart, needed, your heart might have needed a little bit. I think he might want to talk about it. I was just going to come chat with you, but it's good for to start up. I may not. You I don't know if it's up to Mr. Como, but I guess I was the only one available at the time, so here I am before you again. And it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. 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 There were several important bills. There are several important bills that have been filed in the legislature for us to consider. But before I review those with you, some of which I talked about yesterday, I was just reflecting a little while ago, and when you reach my age, you're going to have to write a lot of notes. Otherwise, you're going to forget. And I was just thinking back on, on my life, and I remember that 63 years ago, I fell in love. I was a student at Tulane University in New Orleans, and I met on a blind date a beautiful young lady who was a student at Loyola University, which was just a chain link fence away from my university. And then, 62 years ago, after having graduated from Tulane, I began teaching English in a junior high school. And then a year later, something important happened. So 61 years ago, I was married. <laughs> Still with that beautiful young lady and with her today. 42 years, 47 years ago, I was appointed assistant superintendent of schools there in Jefferson Parish. And in my division was the Department of Student Transportation. And sometimes in those first several months, I thought, oh my God, what did I get into? <laughs> those of you who are supervisors are probably saying the same thing right now. But then it probably wasn't more than two or three, eight years later that I fell in love again. This time it wasn't with a human being, it was with student transportation. And I hope that some of you, I know all of you want, but I hope you'll feel that, that same thing. Because when I retired 31 years ago, I knew what I wanted to do. And that was to be a messenger for student transportation. And just to, to give you a little reason why, I received a phone call about 18 months after I was appointed to the position of student of, uh, assistant superintendent. And just shortly thereafter, the director of transportation was transport, transferred to a different position in the school district. And the uh, superintendent of schools and school board president called me in one day and told me that they were getting ready to move the director of transportation out to another position. So I asked them, well, when are we going to advertise for the village position? Well, we'll let you know when we're ready. <laughs> well, meanwhile, who has to be in charge of the daily operation? Pointing to me. And so I did not hit the ground running, folks. In fact, I was so frightened that I went back to the office and I called one of the secretaries, the transportation secretary who had been there a good while, and I said, Alba, what can you tell me about transportation? What, what can you tell me about resources that I can use? And she said, well, we got a lot of forms here. <laughs> we got some manuals here. And I said, well, who in that room can tell me? And they said, well, the state director of transportation, John DeBard. And I said, okay. Open air pass call. Later that afternoon, I got a phone call from the owner of International 
Arthur, our international truck company there in Jefferson Parish. And he said, uh, congratulations, Mr. Horn. I understand you're in charge of transportation. He said, I guess, congratulations. And I said, well, I hope so. And he said, well, is Louisiana going to require or mandate eight lot warning systems all in all school buses next year? And I said, well, I'm not sure what the state's going to do. But suppose I contact the state and find out for you. And we talked a little bit more and finally hung up. And I walked over to Alva and I said, Alva, what in the hell is the eight lot warning system? <laughs> and she said, never heard of it. See, in those days, we had two red lights in the front and two in the back. There were no caution lights on school buses. And the federal government had been studying this and said, well, you know, traffic doesn't know where you're stopping. So we need to have caution lights. And that was the genesis of the eight lap warning system. So I remember John DeMarge, the state director of transportation, let me call him. And I called him, introduced myself, and I said, Mr. DeMarge, I don't know what the eight warning system is. An international dealer wants to know, and he started chuckling, and I could just see his face. Imagine what it was like there as he thought, another greenhorn. No pun intended on my name, of course. But that is, that is when I realized how much I didn't know. Now, here we are 47 years later. I've remained in student transportation, and there's probably more that I don't know than I do. And part of my presentation this afternoon would not have been Mr. Como's presentation, that I want to assist you in knowing where you can find out some of the important information that you need. By show of hands, how many of you are first time attendees the last time? Congratulations, and we welcome you. By show of hands, how many of you are newly appointed supervisors of transportation with your company or your school district? Okay, great. Now, I want to ask you all this question. Those of you who just raised your hands, do you, would, do you think it would help if we had some sort of orientation program for new supervisors of transportation attached with LASCO maybe on Wednesday morning as we start? Yes. So, would you raise your hands? Okay. I want to pass that information along to the garden and the other officers here for consideration for the next time we have it. You see, when, when I was in charge of transportation, the Department of Education annually had an in-service training program for all the supervisors of transportation around the state. In those days, our legislative session began later and it ended in July. <coughs> The first day of this gathering was for all the newly appointed supervisors. And John DeMarge and sometimes the state trooper and other people would come in and give us an orientation. Some of the veteran uh, supervisors would come in and give us an orientation. They would talk about the records we have to compile. They would talk about resources we could use and such as that. And then the second day and the third day, we all were there, all the supervisors from around the state. And Mr. DeBarge would go through any legislation that had just been approved that affected transportation. He would talk about any new federal regulations that were coming down the pike. And I remember that uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration had just approved a, an instructional curriculum program that was to be used nationwide, and it was wonderful. There was what was called the core units that I like to our Louisiana school bus driver course and coaching the school bus driver today to be used for new hires. And then there were the advanced units that were to be used with our veteran bus drivers. 
And just a few days before the building where the transportation office had been burned down, I recall going out in the attic and, and seeing the boxes of those manuals that we use for training. And of course, they went up in smoke. And unfortunately, Nixon never did upgrade those, and it was discontinued. But just as a point of information, if you go to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration website, which is nhtsa.dot.gov, you can find tons of information to be used for training your bus drivers. How many of you are victims of MAP 21? Not as many. That means that you are preparing people to pass their CDL, to pass their written exam and their skills test. And you have to make certain reports to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and so forth. And Federal Motor Carrier was turned concerned that CEO drivers do not receive enough training in weather conditions, driving adverse weather conditions and such as that. Well, if you go to the NHTSA website, you can find about six units on driving in various kinds of adverse weather, and you can use that to train your drivers and supplement the current CDL manual, which doesn't have a lot of information on it. So the more that we can learn about resources, the more that we can learn about our job. So I'll come to that a little bit more in a few moments. The first bill that I want to review with you is House Bill 66 by Representative McGee. And it requires that public schools governing bodies must determine whether or not, or how, not whether or not, but they must allow an option for children who live within a mile of a school to be able to walk or travel to school in a mode other than school buses. Well, I didn't, I don't know why they had to have another bill because if you look at um, RS 17158, it says that any child who lives more than a mile from school must have the option of being transported, but it also permits LEAs to offer transportation to anybody who lives within them. So why do we have to give special permission? But that also, that bill also says that if a child is in the elementary grades, then the child must be accompanied by a responsible adult. Now, I think that all of us ought to wonder what are the implications for us if we overtly grant permission instead of just flying with the old bill that grants permission anyway. What kind of liability does that put on us? If we say, okay, this child can walk to school, and what if that responsible person to walk with that child is a child who's in the middle school? Not necessarily all middle school children are immature, but many of them are. You know, I'd rather be walking with my friends instead of my little brother, so let me go over here and the little brother gets hurt. So I'll leave this up to you all to report this to your superintendent or somebody in your school district, but you need to be aware of it. And of course, if you just search for Louisiana legislature and you click on the link to bills, you have options of putting in HB or SB, in this case, it's, it's a uh, house bill, and put in that number, and you can get the whole thing and, and how it uh, affects the specific uh, statute. In this case, it's also 17158. I feel like it's a superb bill, but they didn't ask me, so they probably don't care anyway. 
The next one is House Bill 21, uh, Representative Melinda White, who filed the same bill last year. And there is an accompanying Senate bill, which has the same language, number 57 from Senator Patrick McMath. And I think he opposed uh, Representative White's bill last year. But anyway, this is about operational pay for owner operators. How many of you have owner operators in your district? Okay, not many. They're almost like dinosaurs. They're a dying breed because we can't afford it anymore. But it was last in 1988, I believe, that the state of Louisiana state legislature set a minimum of operational pay for owner operators. And there was this enormous uh, schedule. You all may remember the first six miles a certain amount, the next six miles a different amount, anything over 12, then was another amount. But then the length of buses came into play. And what the length of buses really had to do with was capacity, right? Well, uh, Wayne Perio, who was, is a retired owner-operator, and I served on a committee that was called. Wayne was uh, one of, I think, three bus drivers. There were a couple from, from Lafayette, as I recall, owner-operators who were on there. And Brett Schnadelbach, who's now the CFO for Hensboro Parish, he previously had been the transportation director there, and so he was familiar with the financial stuff. So was I, because we had 465 owner operators at one time. And so we were, we were asked to serve on the committee, and Brett and I kind of spearheaded it. And we went into the, the um, compilation of costs of operating the school bus from the time you purchase it, and all the maintenance on it, depending on the equipment, if you have to have a lift, or if you're intended to have air conditioning and all that. So I won't go into a lot of detail about that. But we recommended to the committee that we simplify that formula. And we start with buses that have a capacity of 48 or less at one rate, and then buses that have a capacity that exceed uh, 80 to 48, 40, so 49 plus would go at a somewhat increased rate. And it's per mile from the first mile to the last mile, instead of having those three tiers that you go through. So if you, if you look at the bill, or not the bill, excuse me, the statute itself, you're going to see that there are a lot of lines through parts of it. That means let's throw that out. And then there will be some lines that are underlined. That means let's replace it with this. So if you have owner operators who want to find out what what the proposals are by the Senator and uh, Representative White, go to it. But you don't have to really read both because, you know, they're mirror each other. This is not uncommon in the legislature to have duplicate bills, one in each house of government, hoping that if this one fails, this one can sneak through. Any questions on any of these as I go, you're welcome to, to ask. House Bill 39 by uh, Representative Bryan addresses school bus operators' right to appeal interim disciplinary action. And I think this is kind of a straightforward bill. Let's say that uh, charges are brought against a, bus driver, against a bus driver and the intent is to terminate. But in the meantime, the superintendent decides on a temporary suspension. It can be a suspension with or without pay. This bill grants that bus driver the right to appeal within 20 days of receiving notice of that suspension. So it's, it's kind of a very simple bill, but this doesn't apply only to operators. This is due to every school bus driver. Not only to tenured drivers, because tenured drivers you know, the, the ones that were tenured at the time the law was changed were grandfathered in. So we still have to follow the tenure procedure for those. The next is by 
Representative Muscarello, and yesterday I talked to you at length about this. The main reason for putting this, uh, this act together was to try to be able to introduce MFSADs to Louisiana. You remember what that is? Multifunction school activity buses that are used only for activities and not on daily routes. But there was another part of this bill that we managed to get in and I hope doesn't get called out. And so I wanted to put that whole section in here for you to see. How many of you were here in 2015 when the bill was passed that said we have to vote and unload on the show? Not too many, okay. But I think those of you who have come on board lately recognize that all of your roads don't have shoulders. It's not possible to do that. And some of your roads and even some of your streets and older parts of some of your cities and towns are so narrow that you can't even stay in your lane. Because if you did, the kids would be stepping out into a ditch full of water. And the trouble is our lawmakers don't have our experience to know what our communities are like. And so they pass idiotic laws. And even the Attorney General had to intercede after that law was passed and say they can't do it. And so the next year, they came back with a revision to that, and that was subsection J of RS 17158. Here's what we're attempting to do with this. As you see, everything that's flying through would be removed. And in essence, and let me get here close enough where I can read it. What the final bill, what the final statute would be is prohibit a bus operator from loading or unloading students at near their homes while the bus is in a lane of traffic unless the bus is in the lane farthest to the right side of the road so that there is not a lane of traffic between the bus and the right side curb or on the edge of the road. In other words, you can stay on the road and unload. Now, one of the reasons that this is important is we have too many drivers who are straddling lanes. They think that's safe to do. But in many cases, what they're doing is opening up for a vehicle to pass on the right. Now, I didn't see the news, but my wife reported when it, during the phone call, it may have been since I came up here, but right here in our own area, there was a bus, that, I mean a car, that passed the bus on the right side of the road, and the driver was being praised for having grabbed that child to keep her from stepping off into eternity. These drivers that pull out in the middle of an intersection to try to block cars, all they're doing is allowing space for cars to go around four sides. They said, well, we're doing that for safety. Well, you failed. There's nothing safe about that. Well, what can we do? You move away from the intersection for good sakes. In fact, we teach that in the uh, pre-service training units. So I'm hoping that that will pass. And I have, uh, oh, the note at the bottom there is everything else in that bill addresses the MFSADs, and I listed yesterday every statute that I fetched. Remember color, no stop signal arms, no crossing control arm, those kinds of things that, that the rest of that bill would address. 318 for Representative Carter. Do you remember his name? The seatbelt king? <laughs> wanted to retrofit all of our buses and seat belts. Didn't want us to explain to him something that we heard from our guest speaker about compartmentalized seating. You can't put seat belts legally on compartmentalized seats because those compartmentalized seats were meant to absorb part of the impact of the crash. You put them on seat belt ready frames, which are rigid. So we tried to explain to Representative Carter that in order for us to retrofit, we're going to have to swap out the seats. 
we can't just put seatbelts in there. Now, along comes models beginning in 2011. What happened to seats beginning in 2011? They were raised another four inches, weren't they? Yeah. What did that permit? Shoulder belts. If we had the right kind of frame, right? But most of our buses here in Louisiana didn't have that specification, so we still couldn't do it. Well, finally, when I think Representative Carter got his riches burned pretty badly and his bill fell miserably. He came back. But what he's saying in this bill, as you notice, every new bus placed in service after January 1st, 2023, shall be equipped with occupant restraints. Does that mean three point seat belts? Maybe. What else could it mean? Could it mean compartment line seating? Okay, instructors, how do we define compartment line seating? I can't hear you. Compartment line seating is a passive restraint system designed and constructed and school buses that are not equipped with seat belts. Does this mean if this law passes, we can continue with compartmentalized seating? No seat belts. I don't think that was his intent. Mm -hmm. We talked about the intent of the law today. We brought this to the attention of some parties that hopefully were going to pass it along to him to make sure that if he intends this to be seat belts, he says seat belts. What other kinds of occupant restraints might we have? Car seats. Ever heard of car seat? Is that an occupant restraint? Ever heard of a safety dust? Yeah. Ever heard of a safety seat? Ever heard of an integrated seat? Mm -hmm. You see, it's not quite as simple as a legislator sometimes try to make it. And they're playing to the electorate. They want these parents who say, I have to have a seatbelt in my car, why don't we have one school bus? Well, I'm going to take care of that. They'll reelect me. It's all those other fools that voted against the dairy legislature. They're the ones that cause us. But at least he had the sense to include the clause that retrofitting would not be required. Okay, now, how do we interpret new here? It says new bus placed in service. Is it a newly manufactured bus or a newly purchased used bus brought in from Taylor Bus Sales or from Michigan or somewhere else that doesn't already meet Louisiana specifications? That could be, pardon me? I said a newly manufactured bus. It doesn't say that. It just says new bus. If I go out, if I replace my old bus, I get this new bus. It's not a newly manufactured bus, but it's new to me. It's new to the school system. So anyway, that's a gray area. But I still believe that because of the increased cost, which I understand from the manufacturer's representatives here in Louisiana would probably increase the cost about seven or eight thousand dollars because they would manufacture with the seat belt ready seat frames and, and the seat belts in there. However, what I also heard recently is we can expect the cost of a new school bus to increase from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in the next model years. So it doesn't matter whether it's a hundred dollars or ten thousand of new equipment we're putting in there, 
this other cost is raising it to the point that what's going to happen, I'm sure, because it's happened to other places, is everybody's going to be looking for the oldest buses they can with that, within that 10 year range of, of bringing buses online. And so they're not going to have seat belts anyway. And they're not going to have the other late equipment. So it's just something for, for you to think about and report back. Okay, that's those are the bills that I don't see. Okay, what is the life of a seatbelt in service? I believe, I may need help on this, but I believe it's about ten, uh, seven to ten years. Is that, unless they're involved in a crash and we're in use with means to replace them right away. Is that about right? Okay, I'm getting an odd from from the expert over here. And the same thing applies to the safety vests and the strapping on car seats and other things, the belting material. And you know, we can't just tell by looking at it after a crash. Oftentimes it has to be examined under a microscope. And I'm not sure any of us are expert enough to run the risk of doing that. So even, you know, if you, if you buy a bus equipped with seat belts, expect to have to replace them before you retire the bus, especially in Louisiana. It may be three times because we can keep them on the road for up to 25 years here. As long as they pass inspection, and all you have to do is take it in, they'll scrape off the old inspection sticker and put on a new one, so you know you'll make it. But Parts of Texas. I don't think the whole state has. It's, it's, but anyway. It's not mandatory across the state, correct? I think probably the state that's had them longer than anybody else is New York. The buses have to be equipped with them, but the kids don't have to use them. That's smart. Yeah, what's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know if he's being trapped in these things. He hasn't heard that in Texas there have been any issues of children being trapped in the bus, and I don't know there either. I do know there have been some issues with the misuse of the seat belts, or children getting tangled in seat belts, and things like that. Uh, my understanding is that when, when Alabama did their experiment with seat belts, and um, one, one of the things that, that they got included in there was that the bus driver would not be responsible for ensuring that the children remain belt, uh, belted at all times when the bus was in motion. Because you know, some of these, especially pre, pre k kids, they're like red ants in a pile. You know, you kick the pile and the ants are all over the place and they're up and out of, up, getting out of the seat and everything like that. And you can't be stopping the bus every 10 feet to rebuckle them, and, and we don't have attendance on our buses. Another thing that, that people have recommended, and when I say people, people from the industry in different states is that if you're going to mandate seatbelts on school buses, add a bus attendant to every one of those buses to assist the driver in ensuring that the kids are properly buckled. What if you pulled up to an apartment and had 20 kids getting on there? And now you've got to wait, the driver has to wait to be assured that every one of those children is buckled up. And with those high back seats, you may not be able to see the kids at the belt level all the way back. Folks, so, so all I'm pointing out is these things aren't as simple as they may seem on the surface. There's a lot of detail that goes into it. There needs to be a lot of discussion. The day will come when our buses will be equipped with seat belts, there's no doubt in my mind. But let's try to overcome some of the possible shortcomings before we get there. Instead of what I think one of the things you're bringing up there is in South Louisiana we have so much water. The bayous where I live, drainage canals along all of our major roadways. And when it rains heavily, Automobiles go off in there, and people drown. 
and we think, what if we had a busload of Head Start students or kindergartners or, or pre-K students, and our bus goes off in one of those canals because there was a head-on collision, the bus driver is unconscious, and here are the kids in that bus who can't get out of those seat belts. We've got 65 passenger kids. Or what happens if that bus catches on fire? And we have 30 seconds until that fire is going to race through the bus. And we have two minutes to extract those children and get them out. And the bus driver is incapable of assisting. Those are some of the things that, that go through my head. And that's what makes me pray for these children and their safety. Because they are vulnerable. we got to think about it. Yes. This bill would not die. I, I can remember probably in the last five or six years. Is, is this the same author of this bill? Because I remember we they did a study on this probably maybe about five or six years ago. Uh, I chaired that committee. <laughs> when I was an operator, we went down and we talked to some senators and representatives about this bill and showed them and proved to them that it is not safe to put seatbelts on the bus. Not only what you're saying is correct, but what if those kids use those seatbelts as, as well, weapons? And, I, and you, you know, it's proven. And I had to explain to some of the parents, well, why y'all don't have seatbelts on the bus? I said, this school bus is probably the safest vehicle that kids or you can ever ride versus your car. I said, just, just think about it. Look at the school bus accident. You're right. Think about the time. Uh, we had a, uh, as a matter of fact, the legislature uh, required the Department of Education to form a task force to study this. And Steve, you were on that committee, weren't you? Steve, you, yeah, on the seat belt committee. And uh, we had a pretty comprehensive report. And, and again, it was not, not trying to deny the safety of seat belts in certain situations. And, and you know, there are some seat belts that, in Louisiana and every other state that must have seat belts on them. Do we know who, which ones they are? Special needs. No. Head Start. Head well, Start. Head Start has to have occupant restraints that are not necessarily seat belts. So they retrofitted their compartmentalized seats with safety vests. They had to have occupant restraints. But which ones have they started off with five belts only and now because after 2011 they have to be three point belts. It's based on the GBWR of the vehicle. But the pastor is pastor. It's not the age the kids or anything like that. And don't get it in your mind that just because a child rides on a mini special ed bus or a maxi special ed bus for that. Back, that that child has to be restrained. What's it based on? You heard it this morning. It's based on the IEP. Child's in special ed. Doesn't need a special bus. Rides on the regular bus. He may have to have an occupant restraint. Or he may not have to have an occupant restraint. And vice versa. But the smallest buses that we're allowable that are called or identified as school buses by federal law must have seatbelts. So when we get these MFSABs, if we do, and somebody decides to buy one that has a capacity of say 12 passengers plus the driver, because that's what their golf team can go in or the debate team or something like that, they're going to be equipped with seatbelts. And if they're equipped with seatbelts, guess what the passengers have to do? That's right. And passengers that say children. That's the coaches too. Anybody who is a passenger in that bus is covered by it. Steve? Yeah. I'd like to point out that committee, one of our findings was that the fatalities that were actually occurring. Not Wait. So one of the things we, we found in the uh, committee was that 
the fatalities that were actually occurring were occurring outside the school bus. We weren't able to identify a single incident where a child was killed on the inside of the school bus in this resource that was done. So, where are kids getting killed in the state of Louisiana? They're getting killed by falling under the wheels of the school bus, when they're carrying loaded, they're getting killed by uh, being run over by the school bus in the front, they're getting killed by passing motors. So, the, one of the recommendations of the committee was that if money is going to be spent, that we should focus the spending of, of funds that address those concerns because that's where the fatalities are actually. We're, we want to find a solution to a problem, not a problem, you know, the, the opposite. You know, we don't want to address something that's not happening. We want to address what is happening. And one of the ways of doing that is to arrest, convict, and jail people that are running stop signs over our buses. Amen. <coughs> and and that you say that, and I know a lot of bus operators, including myself, and I know we don't supposed to do it. Uh, that's the reason why a lot of a lot of bus operators, you know, count them. Kind of yeah, 45 degree angle. I, I mean, me as a supervisor. And what he's saying is, because people run the stop signs, that's why bus drivers cross over. You don't address one broken law by breaking another law. <coughs> because we have a solution for that, and that's not to park at the end, stop at the intersection for those not know children. Move it away from the intersection. Then you only have traffic coming in two directions instead of four that you wipe the kids out. But the key to this, and we don't have enough enforcement officers to control all of our roads, but cameras work. It's just the people who are getting the tickets to contact the, ele contact the elected officials and say, this isn't fair, I'm having to face lines, and I was in a hurry going to work. Yeah, you almost kill that child. Oh. I just want to add a, a, a couple of things to what he's saying. Let me bring Michael. He's I'm sorry. <laughs> Speak to my chest. I just can't be quiet when he is talking about all this information that you're learning today. And when you're talking about your legislators and they're making these kind of bills and they are not the, the feet that the paper, they don't know what's going on. They hold our seatbelts and think that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's not. Not necessarily for a school bus. So once you get this information, what do you think you should do with it? Call your legislator, let him know what you're thinking, okay? You have representatives. How do they know what you're thinking if you're not stepping up to the plate? Take this information and do something with it. If you keep it to yourself, it's not worth learning. Amen, sister. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that means that we don't want to just call the legislator who wrote the bill. We want you to call your local legislator and let them know that in your district that you all have concerns about that, that legislation. I hate to say devil's advocate with that, but we do that, and these people ignore your conversation. They totally ignore you to make this phone call. I'm going to get some close now. <laughs> we make these small calls out there. It goes on deaf and you hear that you say that. They totally ignore what he's saying. That's personal experience. Make phone calls, talk to them, yep. do an extra time, you want to shake your hand. But after you let it and you go to them, you're not going to get in the door. That's personal experience. Now, as a collective group, we can make it move, but it's got to be collective. And that's what I think Mr. Horn and Mr. was saying. Yeah, you're right, and let me tell you the personal experiences again. Even before I became superintendent, I went to many parent meetings. It wasn't all PTA, it was other kinds of parent groups too, during the legislative session. And if there was something that would affect the safety of their children, 
negatively or positively, I would talk to those parents, the voters. And I said, I can't get through the door of Representative so-and-so or Senator so-and-so, but I want to explain to you what that person is going to have to vote on. What necessarily they he or she was the author of the bill. If you feel that this bill, if passed, will have a positive effect on your children, I want you to vote for it. If you think it'll have a negative effect on your children, I vote, want you to vote against it. But here's what we as professionals think about that bill, and then we would explain it to them. Now, when you start sticking the voters on the politicians, they'll pay attention. When Roscoe met in Shreveport, Louisiana, several years ago, and invited two state representatives there, one of whom had previously been the superintendent of schools there, Representative Smith, I believe was her name, and we talked about the lack of leadership from the Department of Education and the lack of a consistent training curriculum for the bus drivers of this state. They heard us, they went to the legislature, they passed the bill that became RS-17-161, I believe it is, that forced the Department of Education to develop that curriculum, to train the instructors, and to ensure that we have a universal curriculum. That's what can happen, folks, if we use our power. And there are power in numbers. And the more LASCO members we get, the greater the opportunity for these people to listen to us. We've even had legislators to come to our conference and speak to us. Not if we have 15 or 20 people. If we could fill the side of the room with attendees, and they came here and they said, look at the voters from around the state, I better listen to them. Now, I want to crank you up with some resources here. You see on the screen, Two important supplements to Bulletin 119. You know that Bulletin 119 is sort of the transportation bible for Louisiana. Well, I like to look at these as the New and Old Testaments to go along with them. And, and thanks to Kathy and Steve, Kathy and Steve, Steve was Wayne's brother, uh, <laughs> or as the gentleman sitting here. But we worked many, many hours with this. Now let me give you a little bit of background. Our legislature voted many years ago, back in the, I think it was the 1970s. Maybe I blew a fuse over. Sounds like it's off. Is it off? Yeah. Okay, I'll get the other mic because the green light's on. I believe it was back in the 1960s that the legislature passed a bill requiring that the Louisiana Department of Education adopt the specifications for school buses that were approved by the National Congress on School Transportation. In those days, it was the National Conference on School Transportation. So that meant that uh, if the National Congress voted to require strobe lights on top of a bus, we didn't have strobe lights back then, but I'm using that as an example that you can understand. That if they voted to do that, if it was approved by the Congress, then automatically Louisiana would have to have those strobe lights on each of the buses. Uh, I have a picture of it on the next slide. Thank you. Pretty big book, but it's free to all of you to download. And there are other things uh, that are important uh, in that book. But there are some things that don't apply to Louisiana. For example, Louisiana legislature, as most of you recall, required us not only to add crossing control arms to our new buses, but to retrofit the next year. They required retrofitting all of our buses so that all the buses in Louisiana supposed to have operational crossing control arms. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration 
requires a stop arm on every school bus that is on a route, not the MFSABs. Louisiana requires two on Type 2 buses. Excuse me, on Type 8 and Type 1 buses. What's a Type 1 bus? What's a Type 2 bus? Well, you see, in 1978, the classification from Roman numeral 1 and Roman numeral 2 changed to A, B, C, and D. And now we add MFSAB. So the Type 2 bus is a vehicle that has a capacity of less than 16 passengers, and it has one stop sign. It's not long enough really to have two. Every other bus has to have two. Louisiana requires to have, is required to have on its buses a backing alarm that sounds an alarm when that, whenever that bus is rolling backward, whether it's in reverse, neutral, or drive. I guess we're the only state that, that has that particular kind, and it's a result of a child who was rolled over by her bus at Slidell as it backed over her after the driver discharged the child from the bus. Major error. That's not proper procedure, is it? But the knee-jerk reaction of the legislature from that district was to require not only that we have a backup alarm, but it be this specific guy. And so that went into effect about 1964? No, I mean 94, not 64. I, I can't remember between the crossing control arm and, and the backing arm. One was 96 and one was 94. The crossing control arm was mandated for all buses in Louisiana because in Plaquemine Parish, the driver rolled over a little girl and killed her because she was too close to the front of the bus and the driver was distracted looking in his rear view mirror instead of where the child was after she got off the bus. Anyway, first of all, we completed Supplement 1. So you can look up Bulletin 119, Supplement 1. It was first uh, promulgated in 2019. And this book is dedicated to specification, regulations, specifications, and inspection of buses. If you have your own mechanic shop, you need to have them study this because they may need to make sure that their buses, when they repair them, are in compliance with federal motor vehicle safety standards and Louisiana standards. I recall going into a large district one day after doing some training, walked across the street, some buses had just come out of the shop and they had leaning new tail lights, uh, tail lights on them. Stuck about 24 inches past the rear bumper. I walked into the director of transportation's office and said, take a walk with me. Okay, what, what are we going to see? Well, look at the rear of these buses and tell me what you see. New tail lights. Yeah, what about them? Man, they look sharp. Oh, there are a couple of them. They don't even come out even with the rear bumper. What's wrong with that? What is the requirement, I asked him. He said, hold on, I talk to the mechanics. I said, well, no, I don't have to. I know, I'm going to tell you. Anybody know what the requirement is? <coughs> that is the? Some of those rear bumpers have a little hole in them until comes through there, right? Why do you think it's so important to have that? Most of our tailpipes come out right by the emergency door, don't we? Mm -hmm. Have you ever run your thumb around the edge of a tailpipe? <coughs> I don't recommend it because it's going to slit your thumb like a razor blade. You ever warm up and grab the hot tailpipe? Don't recommend that either, but a kid jumping out of that during the mercy of evacuation, falls and burns his leg, the skin is going to stick to that tailpipe, and we're going to have a big lawsuit on our hands besides having a kid who may be scarred for life. See, there are a lot of these things that not just transportation supervisors or transportation instructors need to know, but anybody that has something to do with transportation needs to know. Your shop people, the people from whom you buy parts, 
I guarantee you, Morris Bart knows. Morris Bart is one of our advertising attorneys. I'm yeah, here. You'll probably see Tina. You'll probably see his billboards until you get out of until you get the Atlantic Ocean. Probably. <laughs> I know. I know from Texas to Alabama, you see his, his billboards and one call. That's all. And then he has these yokels to say, "Ain't my fault." Okay, number two, volume number two. This is for your special educators. This is for your aides. This is for your principals. Not the whole thing, but there are parts in there that you can extract when you download this to use in training and sharing. And we've heard from Tina some, some wonderful comments and information a lot of which you can find in volume two because we took it from the NCST specs, uh, specifications and procedures because we thought that all of you may not access that but if we have an illusion a document maybe you would and that too is available i believe we sent that out in 2020 And of course, the bulletin 119, you know about that. Now, I'm putting three exclamation marks here. To me, in both these volumes, the most important thing is nine pages titled Appendix G. And the heading of Appendix G is Louisiana References uh, for specific topics. I can't tell you how much time the three of us spent researching statutes, federal regulations, Louisiana Department of Education regulations, CDO regulations, to put in here in a topical arrangement. For example, the first thing here is accident reports and accident reporting. Which statutes require bulletin 119 in the different segments? Then alternative fuels. And then alternative fuels tax credits. If any of you are using propane, uh, other alternative fuels, you can file for rebates on some of your Louisiana taxes. Battery or cell phone, a teacher or other school employee. I'm not going to go all the way through this, but nine pages worth. You ought to print that and carry it with you. And be sure that you know about RS 144. No, 40. What, what is it, Wayne? Battery? Uh, 14122. Thank you. Uh -huh. Title 14, number 122. School bus drivers, elected officials, and law enforcement officers are covered in that law. If anybody threatens or attempts assault on them verbally or personally, physically, they've got grounds to sue or have them arrested, even if maybe the school officials don't attempt to do it. You really need to have that at your fingertips. Thank you. That. you can download that from the legislative uh, website. To me, the best thing to do is to just search for Louisiana legislature, and when you do, and those of you who are instructors know that we taught you how to do that, you're supposed to teach your training. When you get to that across the top of it, You'll have things like legislators or uh, representative senators, if you want to find out who they are, laws, bills, sessions, and such. So you put on laws, and when you do, you'll be asked to put in title. So in this case, you put 14, title 14. Then it asks you for a number, 122. And then you click on view. And when you do, up pops the law. And you can print, you can 
cut and paste it. You can do whatever you want to if you want to just read it. But if you remember yesterday, Courtney gave us a litany of laws from Title 14 of reasons we cannot hire certain people to 